Facebook request. And, uh, and when he does, he introduces us to his friends. So why do we need good friends this morning? How does community, that is the friendship, and the friends you have, shape your identity? You know, we're not born, we were born alone, but we're not born to be alone. God always wants us together with others. Starting with your family, God places us in families. For, pe for some people, it's really, it's really a struggle in many ways because uh, sometimes people lose their parents earlier on. And so the family is all broken and disintegrated. But the Lord is good in that he is, he is shaping us through the friends that he has, has he, put, he put in our lives. Some of us have had issues with, with people and, and they've not been altogether good. But nevertheless, in the Lord, it's been my experience, the Lord always brings people together. I remember the first time I, I was trying to figure out what's going on with the Lord and his word, his people, because it was all foreign to me. It was like learning another instrument, which is um, hard, not easy to do, like learning another language. So we're learning to, to understand what God's doing and what he's about in the world. And you're coming out of whatever it is that you have been into for the past couple of decades then you, 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 you're seeing the word of the Lord, you're hearing the word of the Lord, and you're being moved and shaped by the Lord in what he's doing. He places you with some people. I've had some very good friends, actually. Uh, one of my prayers in the very first time, I, I felt that, you know, I think I needed to be part of a church. I said to the Lord, send me to a church where I could meet some friends and then we'll, when we go together, we'll be, you know, at least we won't be lonely. Um, that is in the heavens. So sent, he sent me to this church, which I was part of for a long time. And then I planted this one. So that's basically it, apart from our stint in Cape Town. Uh, I've not known any other church. Um, and that I think is, has been good for me. And of course, since that prayer, God has given me friends all over the world, really, all over the world. And so it's wonderful um, to have, have family and friends or friends have become family. And I know over the years that my life has been shaped by people, good, bad, or ugly, but it's been shaped by people. And, uh, and this morning, again, why do why we need community? And I think it's important for us. Um, and I will share with you an example from the scripture today about Paul, who was who later became an apostle, and how the body of Christ had had shaped him. They didn't know that he was an apostle. Um, like in my case, people didn't know I'm going to end up be, being a full time worker, except my mother knew somehow. I don't know how she knew that, but I guess she knew it. And she said that to me when I did become a, a pastor in full time. She had no doubt, she said. And you remember, she prayed for me when she was not a Christian. She gave me to the Lord. There's something about mothers and children. They have a serious bond. And they are able to tell. They have this seventh sense not sixth uh, not seven so anyway my mom told me that um but at the same time you you're you're uh, you're being shaped by people uh, that, that don't know you they don't know who you are what you're going to be and so to here in this audience we've got people and in your own lives and the people in the church we don't know who they are Really, we know the name, we know they come from this address, uh, but apart from that, we don't know the call of God on their lives. We don't know what God has for them. But, and, but God will use us to shape them, mold them into that which God is calling them to do. I've had friends like that who didn't know, and they came along, I'm talking about mature Christians, 
who were not part of our church at that time that I went to, um, but they had, they somehow had pulled me in and to love and they loved on me, prayed for me. I remember one, one of them trying to fill me with the spirit. You know, let me pray for you. Put me in the center on a chair, wrap me up in every way possible so I can speak in tongues, you know. Never happened. Not at that time. Happened much later. Not much later, but, uh, you know, just happened. But anyway, the point is the friends shape you, mold you. Stay away from people, good people, good friends. You will remain static. That's that for a small introduction. All right. Proverbs 27, verse 17 says, As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend. As iron sharpens iron, so a friend sharpens a friend, helps them become more pointed, I would imagine, help them to become more clear about their call on their lives. And, and I can tell you this, that as I had so many wonderful friends and even peers, people my age and my that young people at that time, I think we shaped each other. We sharpened each other. And we would share with each other the word of the Lord. There's no time for gossip and all that. There's really no time for that. It was like we were on the road. We were ministering to people, loving people, going to meet in homes. And, uh, and even uh, in uh, Rani and I, our dates who were visiting people, other people. Some of them are married people. We were not married. We go there and counsel them, their marriage. And, uh, you know, it is wonderful. We just spent our lives uh, pursuing the kingdom in that way. And so uh, over the couple of weeks, we discussed the role of the father, the role of the son, and the role of the spirit in shaping us and making us into the image and in, in the identity of the son of Jesus. Last week, we looked at one verse or at a chapter, one Psalm, Psalm 8. And in it, uh, the Psalm talks about a man under God who God will, will, will help place all his enemies under his feet. And today we, we see people struggle like that, along with other things in their lives that are trying to bring them under control. God is wanting to help you become the kind of person in the world that is in Christ, placing all the enemies of God under you. So you overcome as you go along, but you don't do it alone. You can never do this on your own. You need one another. You need people to speak into your life. And sometimes we are, we, we are guilty of speaking really broken things into people's lives, breaking them even further. They go watch very carefully because you're dealing with God's people. You're dealing with God's, the God who brought people out. I, I, in my early days, I remember having one or two people that said things that were not very nice. But somehow God helped me get through it. So you've got to be very careful about how you speak and what you speak. Especially to another person because your road, their road is very different. Our job is to help sharpen them. And sharpening them by giving them sharp words don't help. Don't help. Try to love people rather than try to drop them down. That's, that's not going to help anyone. And so people have struggles, a lot of struggles. They have a lot of enemies. I'm talking about people. They have other th struggles in their own lives. They have enemies that, that need to be put under their feet. And this psalm is talking about a man like that. But really what this psalm is alluding to more than anything else is the man with a capital M, Christ. Also known as the second man, the last Adam. So God places us under and in this man and then because we are in him all the enemies that we have will be placed under our feet that's what God does what God is doing is placing us within families the local churches that will shape us and mold us into the image of Christ not in the image of one another in the image of Christ I'm not even trying to make people into vineyard people you know 
my whole focus is to make us all into the image of Jesus the Christ. Yeah, veneer is one thing. Christ is yet another. Hopefully at some point they connect. It's important for us to have Christ in the middle. So in the Godhead, talking about the Father, Son, and Spirit, and I'm assuming you've heard some of this stuff, um, but if you haven't, yeah, you have to go back there. But in the Godhead, no one did their own thing. Nobody did their own thing. No one acted unilaterally. They all worked together and made it happen. They modeled what a family ought to be, how a family life ought to go. Uh, they model how a church and the body uh, does life. And so what God is calling us into, into this Trinitarian fellowship is the people of God are being invited as we get reconciled to the Father, we are called together to live out this life with one another. So we can say that when we hear and know and understand and do God's will, we do it by the combined work of the Trinity in the body of Christ. So we're together. Our, our life is on a whole different planet, on a whole different plane. Let's put it that way, rather than a planet, rather a different plane, a spiritual plane. We called out of the world, and there's so much nonsense in the world, so much trouble. And they don't want, we don't want to bring people from there and come here and make them even worse than they were. Jesus had that complaint against the Pharisees. So we need to love them and love on them. They've had enough enemies outside. And our job is just like in a, on a conveyor belt. Yeah, people on a conveyor belt going along. And so our job is to do our part in their lives. And somewhere along the conveyor belt, there might be a finished product. And they might join the queue and helping others finish the products that God is putting their, in their way. And we may not see them again. You know, we've had thousands of people that went through our doors. We might not see them. But from time to time, I hear from people. And they said, I've been to your church sometime. Really? Okay. How are you doing? Doing all right. Okay. That's all that matters. So when the body of Christ acts in harmony with, the, with, with God's will, then life happens. People are shaped. They, they are sharpened. They are encouraged into the, in, 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 with their own identities tied up to the Lord. So a local church grows as each part does its work while being held together. Listen to this text in, in Ephesians before we get to the story of Paul. We carefully, we are carefully joined together. And this morning I was reading this text again. That word carefully came up to me very strong. We are carefully joined together in him. It is like an artist. I thought I had at that time an artist. You know, there are ways to join wood. When you look at some of these videos of how people do things, I like watching them from time to time, how they actually do it. You could, you could actually use uh, screws and nails and so on. But, but some artisan that's really good, you don't need all that. You just need to measure right and fit it exactly how it ought to be. And that's what the Lord is doing with this church. We are carefully joined together in him. And if, if somebody is really joined to me, very carefully joined by God in me, and, who, and we are together in him, I tell you, there, there's something I have to do to help that person. Right? Hmm. Becoming a holy temple for the Lord. Through him, you Gentiles are also being made part of his dwelling, where God lives by his spirit. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly. Again, no nails, no bolts, no nothing, but just joined together, just held together by the spirit, just made right, shaped right, so you can measure right and put together and nobody can bust us out. If somebody tries to break us out, they're in trouble with the one who put them together. Hmm? Hmm. So he makes the whole body fit together perfectly 
How does it work? As each part does its own special work. And there's no way, you know, you cannot, you can function without me. And similarly, there's no way I can function without you. I can't just be made into a little wood in a, in a product myself. If I'm the product, I can never be made into a holy temple on my own. Hmm? We need each other, all of us. We must do our part. Everyone might say, well, I don't know what my gifts are. Well, you need to find out. How are you going to find it? Well, you're going to start exploring those things. Who's going to tell you? You know, and I get somebody from a USA or someplace like that. Thou saith the Lord. Eh? Yeah, you got to find whatever your hand finds to do. That's what I did. I taught Sunday school. I ran on the street, preached on the street. I did all kinds of things. Until the Lord said, okay, now this is what you ought to do. This is where you're headed. Even now, I think my function is somewhat there and is always in flux because of what he wants to do going forward. He makes the whole body fit together perfectly as each part does its own special work. You all have a special work. And because we have a special work, you help the other part to grow. So the whole body is healthy, not healthy without you working together with the other. I can never do it without you. You can't do it without me. So the whole body is healthy and growing and full of love. So if each part does its work, then, uh, then I am shaped and sharpened by the other parts that is a community. And in the story that I'm about to read to you, or talk about uh, concerning Paul, you know, this should be an encouragement to you. I need, I need your encouragement. You need my encouragement too. If I did not do my job, you would not be encouraged, right? Similarly, I need your encouragement. We sharpen each other. We help each other. We don't judge each other. We help each other. We help each other, find each other's identity. My job is to make sure that you are at the, the top of your class, you know, at the top of your game, whatever that is that God's calling you to. That's my job. So that you'll find your place and purpose in Christ. What's your job? Same thing toward us, toward me. So, you know, you need the encouragement. I need the encouragement. That's the role of the body church. So here in Paul's life, Paul was shaped by his brothers to help him find his apostolic ministry, apostolic identity. He didn't know that. God called him and told him then this is what's going to happen. But we need all learn to embrace help, by the way. Sometimes some people don't like to get help. I can do my own thing. You never do it. How are you going to do it yourself? How are you going to be this pulpit if you, this is what the product is without the parts? We need each other. Everybody's a part. Then the person down there might say, but I'm not recognized. Yeah, of course you're not recognized, but God knows you're there. And without the foot, this whole thing won't stand. Right? I love you. You're very excited people. So, Paul, look at it in chapter 9 of Acts. This is how he was called. He was persecuting the Christians. He was murdering the Christians, actually. He was going to city, from city to city, bringing people, take them out of their houses and putting them in prison. And then they were taken, thrown to the lions, thrown, to, put on the stake, burnt alive. I mean, hey, he was a heavy guy, heavy dude. But he was doing it all in the name of the Lord. But one day, the Lord met him. He fell, verse 4 says, to the ground as he was on his horse. He fell to the ground and he heard a voice saying to him, Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? And the Lord took this very personally because the body of Christ, with well, all these are different parts in the body of Christ, if God and somebody is persecuting one part, you're not persecuting that body only. You're persecuting me. Jesus takes it personally. That's why I don't like scolding the church. How's that for application? Very fast that was. 
Some people like must call the church. Tell them what for. That's a bad spirit, that one. It might not be what God is, the way he's thinking. So you got to be, the spirit of the prophet is subject to the prophet. That means you keep your spirit to yourself. But bring what God is bringing. Well, that was free, but anyway, that's okay. So he fell to the ground. Why persecuted me? God took it personally. Who are your Lord? He didn't know. He didn't know. And the voice replied, I am Jesus. He got a shock, I'm sure. The one you are persecuting. I, I took it personally. I take this personally. You breaking one of my parts of the building, you, you're hurting me. You're persecuting me. Be careful. And if you treat one of these little ones, um, give them... Uh, love in my name, then you're blessing me, the Lord said. Did he say that? So to the opposite of, of persecution and whatever it is, when you gossip about somebody or you hurt somebody with your words, woo, you're in trouble with the boss. In trouble with the big boss. He is not happy about that. So you be careful how you conduct business and how you say what you say. Rather you don't say you got nothing good to say, don't say. Everybody, you know, it's something about a soccer when you watch it. You go to the soccer match. I've been to a few. You got, and even, even if you watch it on TV, and everybody, you can see everybody on the, in the stands are all referees. I mean, they're all judging those poor fellas that are running, they're beating themselves to death. People are bleeding, falling down, getting hurt. All of those things are happening. But the referees, there's one referee there, he knows he's such under such pressure because now everybody is refereeing the referee. It is so like that in the world, by the way. Everybody is judging you. Everybody knows better than you. But they don't know what your struggles have been, right? So you need to be careful how you manage what you say. And he says, who are you persecuting? I am Jesus. Now get up and go into the city and you'll be told what you must do. And so at the same time, while that was going on, the Lord spoke to Ananias. Uh, is it just an ordinary individual? Never heard of him before. Neither did we hear about him after that. But once it was somebody who could hear the Lord, could hear the Lord. And in, and in same chapter nine, you read verse 15. And the Lord saying to him, but the Lord said to him, go for Saul is my chosen instrument to take my message to the Gentiles and to the kings and to kings, as well as to the people. Look at the, the scope of this guy's ministry. And Ananias, when he was called, he said, listen, um, there is a guy, Saul, who's, uh, who has seen in a vision, somebody like you, Ananias, going there, laying hands on him. Uh, and that he would receive sight. He was blinded. That man has been given a vision to see you. You need to go and see him. And this fellow said, no way. Do you know what he did? You know. A referee. He's killing people. He killed people. How you can judge people when they walk in, say, into the church by just looking at them? Why they're wearing, wearing a very short dress. You see, when you start applying all these things, then you put pressure in the wrong place. Hmm? We can't. People, you know, you know, there were times when they could not wear pants, the ladies. But that's all the clothing they had. Or they might be also have other needs. That's why they wear pants. Put on a dress, come to church. Hmm. Who said that? Nowhere in this text does it say that. In fact, the guys wore the dress. If you want to be a little bit more technical. Is it? And they, they, did, they did more minis than anything else, the guys. They had a skirt that came above the knee. So, don't get technical about it. Bible. 
It is your heart that needs sorting out. You don't have to look there. What you, you see the person come with a very short thing. Why are you looking there then? You know, you know, there was a lady in the, um, what, the Samaritan woman. But God, no, chose her to, to be, to have a serious apostolic ministry. That lady, that lady. She was married, divorced five times. Five. And then she got so fed up after five times, she decided to stay with somebody on the sixth. She must be a very good looker, right? For somebody at five and then six one. I know if I were to come to the rescue of that lady, I don't know what the first fellow, he might have just died. You know, sick and died. So she had to get married again. But she got divorced from that guy. Or maybe he was, uh, maybe he was very abusive. I don't know. Or maybe he didn't want her. It could be anything. By the time you get to a second marriage or a third marriage, ooh, that people, the church people there, referees, they are now worried about it. who made you a judge? Hello? Who made you a referee? No, you got to hear the Lord. You got to hear God. You, know, you don't know who is coming in. There's a Samaritan woman who didn't want to meet with other ladies in the town. Obviously, for obvious reasons. Because she might have taken some of their men. I don't know. Who knows? And so the woman said, you don't trust the hair. And they tell the men, don't talk to her. I like that. I've seen that before, by the way, in my life. I said to the woman, what are you looking at? What are you looking at for? Look at her. Look at the side. I look at the guy and think, oh, all right, okay, wonderful. Enjoy, enjoy. And so, it's a, it, Jesus met her. Jesus wanted her. Imagine that. There were no referees there. Those that came, came to see him after bringing some food, they said, Lord, we bought some bunnies for you. You're going to eat. Chicken bunny we got, mutton bunny. And he said, no, I got bunnies you don't know about. <laughs> Look at this. I'm dealing with some serious issues. That woman became very instrumental, I believe, in reaching this, that town, the old city, Samaria. That lady. She was radically changed. She didn't continue her life. Uh, she got radically changed. That's what happens when you meet the Lord. Something would change. You can't, you and I can't change people, but the Lord can. So the Lord sends people, and some of them, sometimes they come in really, but my pastor said things to me, was a little bit hard when I first came to the Lord, because he would say things like that from the pulpit. Uh, some of you smell like the world. You look like the world. You know, all of that. And, and it smelled like the world means I'm smoking so much. <laughs> That anywhere near a radius of a couple of meters, you would get it. That's why people think that when they smoke, they can't. Everybody can get it. All around you. But I looked like the world because I didn't have clothes. I had clothes that were, you know, meant for the, for the, for the dance places, you know. I was involved in music. So I had my hard pants with the bell bottoms, with the flower band around the bottom. You know that one? Yeah. Hard, jack, hard pants, jacket, army jacket, this and that and the other. It was really, you know, a very different life. I came like that. I had to pray for clothes. I was a mess. Imagine the referees. And my pastor was one of the referees. Smell like the world, look like the world. And then my, my hair was longer and longer, longer than, you know, if you, any hair, guy's hair, that is longer than the um, collar, it's long. I would imagine that pastor would be turning in his grave today with people that are in the church, such long hair tied in a thing and all of that. I can people judge people for stupid things. 
And it's the Lord. Now, here's a guy, he's coming in, and this fellow says to the Lord, no, man, that guy was killing people. He says, listen, go for my servant. So Saul is a chosen instrument. Go, go there. He's going to take my message, and I will also show him how much he must suffer for my name's sake. And so he was, he got healed as he went to the guy, pray for him. He was healed and he was taken in. And then verse 23 begins uh, of the same chapter. After many days, they'd been there, he'd been fine, refreshed, working among the people, hanging out with the church. After many days had gone by, the Jews conspired to kill him. It wasn't long before they had enemies also. This man, who was a killer, now was being hunted. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night, they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. So which way he's going, how, what's his plan? Imagine that. Here's a new believer in the Lord. Nobody knew what he's going to become. Nobody knew that. So you have people walking to the church. You don't know what they're going to be. You don't know if they're going to be turning church with upside down or some part of the world upside down. Who knows? But when they come, they come in in a broken state. But we have referees. And we lose the fruit. See, then you've got to be very careful how we minister to one another. So they, the brothers together, we are talking about shaping, being shaped by the community. But his followers, talking about Paul's followers, took him by night. And they put him in a basket and lowered him in a basket through an opening in the wall. They, they, it was very dangerous work because now they become accomplices against the authorities that were there. They put him in a basket and is holding the rope for him to put him over the wall so he can get away. So the city gates are locked, people are watching the gates. He was let out over the wall. And you think, how would God deliver this person? Well, he will help everyone by the work that the spirit of the Lord is doing through the church. And so verse 26 goes, and when he came to Jerusalem, he went, went there to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. How much can the guy say, hey, by the way, I, I know I, the Lord met me, this, that, the other, I'm a Christian. When you look at somebody, they don't look like that initially. They don't. And you, you, because you've been hurt so much, you try to cut them off. But Barnabas, yes, Barnabas, and his name means son of encouragement. That's what I believe God is calling each one of us to be in the world. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. And he, Barnabas, told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and the Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. And he talked and debated with the Grecian Jews, but they tried to kill him. So he was making friends but also making some enemies. Those who were his friends before now are wanting to kill him. Have you noticed? And when the brothers learned of this, again, the brothers, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. The brothers were there shaping him, helping him become this new person that God's called him to be, to be this apostolic guy. They didn't know that. They just helped him, came along, ordinary guy. And what does that word mean? When they sent him off, you know what it means? They say they sent him off to Tarsus. What that means, whatever his scripture says, they sent him on his journey. Well, they funded the journey. They paid for him to take a boat or some kind of transportation. They paid for that. Put him on his journey. Because he wasn't at that time working. He is now a new guy. He was doing the other things, but now he is this guy being shaped by the, by the body of Christ. See, we need to learn these things. We need to learn and be awake to what God might be doing with the individuals. And so he was brought back by Barnabas. And later on, you find in chapter 11 of Acts, there was a movement and the Antioch began, the church began to grow and all kinds of wonderful things were happening. And... Um, and so now there were Gentiles being saved. And Paul had told them that God is going to bring the Gentile in. The Gentiles and Jews were a real different breed of people. One was circumcised, one was not. And so they had, 
they had nothing in, much in common and the Jews that were circumcised didn't like Gentiles because they thought they were dead, you know, in the water, people living in darkness. But now Paul was sent to them and God drawing those people back in. God had to bring, send somebody. The Jews were not happy. So when Antioch happened, Barnabas looked at the activity of God, the fact that Gentiles were coming to the Lord. He remembered Saul, what Saul had told him. And he went to look for him. By the time Tarsus, he had gone to Tarsus, remember, and he was there for 13 years in, the, in, the, in, in that area. 13 years away from Jerusalem. Long time. He was a, an apostle in the making. God was raising him up, kind of living in obscurity. So Barnabas goes back and he fetches him. Meanwhile, the believers who had been scattered, verse 19 says, during the persecution after Stephen's death, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, Antioch of Cy Syria, they preached the word of God only to the Jews. Now we are talking about the body of Christ. We're talking about people who need to shape you, people that want to help you, and you need to help them be shaped into the ministry God has called them to do. So the ministry of the Gentiles began first time in, in Antioch. So verse 25, then Barnabas goes out to Tarsus to look for Saul. When he found him, he brought him back to Antioch. Both of them stayed there with the church for a full year, two of them, Barnabas and Saul, teaching large crowds of people. It was at Antioch that the believers were first called Christians. Remember, there's a new guy, right? But if he's gone away for 13 years, he sought the Lord, and he was somebody that's pursuing the Lord, fasting and praying, studying the scriptures, and he was being shaped by the, uh, the word of the Lord, and then, and then, God opens the door. It doesn't happen with man, really, but man is important. But God will open the door. And we need Barnabas. We need people that can encourage one another, help one another, see the, see the good that God's doing in people. You know, see the good in that person. See that, see that maybe this person looks like the world, he smells like the world, but there might be some other jewel that is in this person, treasure that this person has or is. And I'm so glad for, for people that saw that in my own life. And they um, pushed me on, pushed me forward. I'm glad for them. And so Paul was being taken by Barnabas, taken in. And you can read, the, in fact, it'd be good for you to read the book of Acts as you go along. Wonderful things. And so finally, uh, in, in chapter thir 13, we read how Paul was there in the same, same church. He's being sent now in the church at Antioch. It starts like this in verse 1. Now in the church at Antioch, there were prophets and teachers. Barnabas, Simeon called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Menean, who had been brought up with Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. There were people there leaders, and they were worshiping the Lord and fasting. And while they were doing that, the Spirit said, set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work which I called them to. Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work. Here again, the Lord finally must get his man. He must get his woman. It's the Lord. You know, he's called you for a special thing, not just to do whatever you're doing there, but whatever you're doing, whatever it is, God has a plan and, and it's preparing you for the kingdom work. It could be there. It could be wherever you are. But it is, it is not just about you earning a buck. It's not about you just earning a, your, your meal or whatever it is that you, yeah, you, whatever it is you're doing. I believe God is shaping you in the body of Christ. It's more important, this thing that God is doing in your life. So let's not negate the, the role of the body, I, 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 I'm telling you. The, your identity is wrapped in community with people. Your identity is wrapped. You can't just be yours, your own person. I've been so hurt in my life. I can not want to talk to anybody. I can't trust you. Of course you can't trust people. You can't trust people, there, but you need to find them, and those that you can trust. You need to learn if they can be trusted with the information you give them. They're not like the referees. And you test them with a little and you see how far they go with it. Then you can give your, take the risk. 
everything is a risk, obviously. But I tell you, your, your identity, your, my identity is wrapped in community. That's where it is. The body, the family are the only ones that recognize, release, and send. I've had people in the church who finally just lost it. They couldn't handle it. They went out, want to do their own thing. And um, I didn't lay hands on them. I didn't release them. Not because I didn't want to. I was not given the opportunity to do that. They just wanted to do it. There's nothing I can do about that. There were people I know I said clearly to, don't do this. You can't do this. You're not able to do this. When I was in Cape Town, I had the same, same things. I said to people there, I said, I don't think you're it. You need to pray seriously about what God's called you to do. But I don't think it's to take this particular fellowship. Can't do this. Um, it's the way it is. So the family is the only one that can recognize and release and send. The only ones. And not, not everybody can do all of these things. There's only one Paul that can do that role. And in the body of Christ, they grow in that role. I could talk about that uh, at length concerning what he did. And the, but God's people need to work together. You recall the four people that let down the bed into the presence of Jesus. You remember that? The four men who opened the roof to let their friend down in front of Jesus. I tell you, the men who held the basket for Paul, setting him through the wall. Andrew who brought Simon, Simon Peter. Simon Peter became more important, well, in the eyes, our eyes, more important than Andrew. Andrew was the one who brought him. Andrew is important, Andrew. So we need others to mold us and shape us for kingdom work. It's not about us making a name for ourselves. It is about what God wants. And our job is to mold as iron sharpens as iron sharpens iron, so our friends shape us and sharpen us. You remember Ananias, he found, he was sent to Paul and there was a Barnabas that, was, that saw Paul and loved on him. Others were trying to kill him. No, you, you have to be different. When there are people hounding you, and sometimes even people, maybe church people, you need to be the one that will say, I love you, man. Come, let's do this. Let's do this. Let's do this. Let's, we can do this. We all have very, very different gifts. We all are shaped by the Lord and placed together. We all have different functions, but we must learn how to work together. Amen? Uh, and of course, it, it, the recognition by the church comes by longevity. It just can't, can't just come one week Two weeks and this thing was ah, like we got it made. We're all right. No, we need to be here for a while, learning the ropes. Even Paul didn't have it easy on the first day. God told him, This is what you're going to become. But it was 15 years later, he was being thrust into, into the work. At least that 15 years later, he was being thrust into the things that God called him to do. So he was being shaped and molded in the meantime. Let's not think there's going to be a fast and uh, things that are fast don't, they're not strong. I'm told that glue is like that. The glue that, that bonds fast is the weakest. The one that takes longer to, the longer time to bond. You can't pry it, can't open it. It's stronger, much stronger. Amen. Finish now. Stand with me. So, let's pray. You know, we have different gifts, each one of us. I want you to just think about that for a second. What God might be calling you for. What is your work? What is your ministry? What is your gifting? Those are important things, by the way, because then 
you are able to be a blessing to people around you. You will be different. The way you approach things will be different. You got to learn how to love and care for people, perhaps. Not everybody will be sent to people to care for people in that way out there in the road. But certainly God has called you for something. You got to find out what that something is and be an encouragement, an encouragement more than anything else. I want to pray for you, your gifts, your ministries, your heart in, in pursuing the Lord and be a blessing to the people around you. And as you function in that which God has called you, it will be recognized, I believe, by the church, the people of God. So, Lord, I pray for each one of us and the gifts that you've given us and the spirit of God that's upon us, in us, with us. Lord, I, I commit ourselves to you. Now, people that are online, particularly here today, who are thinking very seriously about their role, I ask you, Lord, for your guidance, your leading. Be with each one, I pray. Lord, may each one find their place. May they learn how to trust. May they learn how to receive help. May they ask for help. May the Lord encourage one another. Put the arms around others and draw them in and saying, it's okay. It's going to be fine. Your suffering is not without merit. God knows what's going on. God is allowing some things, but I don't know why. But I'm praying that God will bring you out of this or give you the strength to grow, go through it. Whatever it is, let's, let's, let's not become the referees in the world. Let's become the ones that are playing and they're coming alongside, putting in the oil and wine in the wounds of people bandaging them and getting them all readied up to play again, to go back on the field and to do what God's called them to. Pray your blessings, Lord, upon each one of us, especially this church. And I ask that we will be that kind of people to our world. We love you and we thank you, bless you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Take care of yourselves.